Hi, I'm Toby. And I'm Nick. And welcome to another episode of the Pure Property Podcast. This is where we give you bite-sized chunks of our industry insights and knowledge to help investors invest intelligently. And this week's episode, uh, we're going to be going over frequently asked questions. So me and Nick have been putting our heads together and thinking, what questions do we get asked a lot, especially at the moment? Um, can we put that into an episode uh, and put it out there? Uh, so yeah, it's it's a good go-to for investors. And they might be questions that you may have or uh, listeners may have, and they can have a listen, hear our responses, hear our take on the questions and go from there. Perfect, perfect. So before we dive into the episode, a lot of our more avid listeners will realise that we uh, we haven't been around for a few weeks now, uh, we've been exceptionally busy. Um, so Toby, I don't know if you want to provide a bit of an update your side very briefly. My side is, yeah, well, I've been, been very busy, especially the last, last few weeks anyway. So um, I've now got a newborn baby boy. I've been crazy enough to have a third... <laughs> child <laughs> couldn't resist <laughs> couldn't couldn't hence hence the hairline getting further and further back <laughs> um so yeah I, I had to drop off the radar for a bit just while he got settled in with his with his two elder sisters and and his mum of course so yeah just been busy doing that and still try try and stay on top of of work and the business property market and track capital in general but it's it's all good he's all settled in now I'm back to I'd say some sort of normality, hmm. um, getting back into the swing of things, and yeah, just just trying to take take one day at a time. And Nick, I suppose your background probably gives a bit of an indication as to why you've you've been a bit quiet. I mean, because that clearly isn't I don't know London or Grimsby or anywhere like that. <laughs> it's it looks sunny and it looks a lot nicer than where I currently am at the moment. Yeah, I'm not sure if you can get the the full view there, but yeah. So as well as Toby obviously being busy, um, and myself being the the other director of the company, I've now relocated to Dubai, um, for a number of reasons, mostly personal, um, but also some commercial opportunities you might be looking at here as well. Um, so yeah, between me and me and Toby, obviously spending a bit of time away from the business, uh, our content rate has slowed down a bit, uh, but luckily. Um, our sales have been absolutely exceptional, a really strong team effort. Um, it's been the best performing uh, month we've ever had in the company's history. Um, so I think, you know, we're both obviously very, very pleased about that. But without, you know, blowing our trumpets too much, Toby, uh, what was your sort of insight for August? How you feel it went, what we did well, etc.? Yeah, I mean, we, we tend to find in general um, in the property market that August tends to be usually a bit of a quieter, slower month uh, just because people are on holiday, uh, kids are off school as well. There's usually a lot going in August or, or people then get ready to get back uh, into work and back into the swing of mm. things if they've been on holiday in September. So you tend to find it's a steady, quietish month and then it really picks up September onwards. But yeah, it started sort of, all guns blazing at the beginning of the month then it kind of settled like we expected it to and we were like okay this is a normal august and then literally i think it was the last week it absolutely just went crazy um and mm. in general yeah it was just it was just a very sort of active buoyant month but i think when, when you look at the market in general it's it was maybe a bit naive to think it was going to be a, a slower month just with the sort of the bottleneck of, of demand that's been building up for yeah, a year just in general lack of supply it was it was yeah it, it was bound to happen but yeah it's good it's positive and definitely can't complain on that side of things yeah definitely I think a lot of people obviously didn't uh they weren't away on the summer holidays as much as they probably normally would be for obvious reasons um so yeah obviously really happy um you know repeat investors new business uh we've got september off to a great month as a great start as well so yeah all, all good on our side so today um we'll do a bit more uh, as toby said of the the q a slash frequently asked questions side of things with the aim of uh letting our investors get some sort of valuable insight and some knowledge uh things they might be thinking that's on their minds what they're considering when they're looking at properties to invest in um so yeah hopefully we'll run through a few of those so Toby, I don't know if you want to pick a question first and then maybe I can reel off a bit on that. Yes. So I'll start off with one of the frequently asked questions. What can we go with? Um, I'll tell you what, 
Um, I know this is actually quite a good one that you you actually like to cover. So we'll start with this. Um, what are the benefits of off plan investments? Now, this is obviously something that we do encounter quite a lot because when we speak to our investors, they don't always know uh, a ton about off plan investments, and they may be used to the, the the standard secondary market. So, yeah, that's one of the questions that I'll, I'll start with for you, Nick. Cool. Um, and yeah, we'll try and keep these relatively quick fired. We, you know, obviously we can speak for for potentially hours <laughs> about these, but yeah, we'll try and give you the headlines. Um, so firstly, with regards to investing off plan, the first thing that most people think about is the price. So you should, if you're buying from the right developer at the right time, get a strong discount on the development. Now, it's really important not to compare a new build off plan scheme to something that's on the secondary market in 10 months old. Oh, sorry, 10 years old. You know, you could go on right move and you could find stock for, for a lot cheaper than you're going to see in a new build scheme. But you're comparing, you know, a brand new car to an old car that's 10 years old. It's, it's just not a fair comparable. Um, so in most cases, one of the major benefits that investors will, will invest in off plan or one of the main reasons is because they're going to get that discounted price up front. Um, and that should be for the ticket price and the price per square foot rate. So you've got to make sure what you're actually buying what you're getting for your money is is worthwhile. Uh, secondly, you get to pick out the most desirable units in the scheme. This is an absolutely huge one for me. With the amount of development that's happening across our major cities in the UK, Manchester, Liverpool, Birmingham, London, well, actually all of them, Leeds, Sheffield, they're, they're all growing very, very aggressively. So there's a lot of development and potentially a lot of competition. So if you can buy into a scheme early and pick a unit with a USP, then that's going to really differentiate your product from someone else's and make sh- so I think I lost connection slightly there but that will uh, really differentiate your product from someone else's and um, so things like the balcony both across the the bedrooms and the living area if possible great views larger than average size um, if you can get a corner unit with um you know a dual aspect view that's great uh, if you're near the um some people see it as a pro some people see it as a con but if you're near entrances or communal areas it's you know there's a lot of things to think about of how you can make your specific apartment stand out in in the crowd so getting uh, getting in early and picking out those desirable units is always um always a bonus i think the other thing is the incentives and the packaged items that you can get with the developer and i'll finish off on this one toby you can maybe pitch in with any that, that you can think of um but getting a package and getting a, an incentive from a developer is is a really strong bonus and it can add up to actually quite a significant amount. Now, this will come in the form of, you know, free furniture packs, uh, contributions to legal fees, contributions to stamp duty bills, fixed rental assurances for one, two, three years, depending on the type of property. Um, but by the time you've negotiated with your broker, who should be good and doing it on your behalf, and you're dealing with a reputable developer who's, you know, open to some discussion, you can secure yourself a very, very, you know, good value investment package. But just to recap on those then, so the discount, the ability to pick the unit, and then the ability to get a packaged investment offer um, where you're being incentivized to purchase off plan. Those are my three I'd probably mention. Yeah, no. And I think touching on on the the price part there and you mentioned about a new car etc now one of the benefits of a new build or, or a new car is one you have the warranties uh so if something if something does go wrong you you're covered um and also there's there's less likely uh chance for things to go wrong because they are new so your maintenance and ongoing costs will will tend to be a bit fairer on that basis so what we find with the off plan is you're getting the benefits of a new build which as investors uh investors do tend to like uh, that side of things because it's shiny new uh, less less hassle and less maintenance issues and costs going forward you're getting that aspect but for a better price because as we know when you're buying a new build property you're paying a premium for once it's complete uh, but when you're buying off plan you're getting that discount so you're getting best of both there so you're getting a good price and you're getting the benefits of a new build property which i think is very very strong i think the the other thing that we will have to mention is just be careful that the 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 price you're paying is is not being perceived as discounted because we've seen it in some poorer schemes or developments where they'll make out as if you're 
you're getting a discount as a buyer um but you're not you're just paying the normal normal rate or that they've put they've put extra on top and they're just taking that off and pretending mm, it's discount so just, just be careful on that so do 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 be careful on, on that uh, research and due diligence is key on that and i think for me the other thing that um i'm speaking to investors about at the moment as a benefit of off plan and this is market dependent is the market that we find ourselves in at the moment which is very buoyant a very a very restricted flow of supply as we can see um happening and within the data um what you're finding is if you're going out and viewing on a normal market it's very very busy so what is happening is for example if you have been out viewing you may know this already but you'll go go on right move you'll find uh, a, a flat it's it's up for resale so the owner's living in it selling it or it might be an investor selling their their property already rented out it's already been lived in on the open market you'll try and book a viewing one you'll probably be lucky if it's a good location good area you'll be lucky to get a viewing in the first place two if you do you'll probably be getting, be going along to an open day or be up against a lot of people while viewing so it'll be very very busy and then three if you do actually like it and then you go to buy it or offer on it, you're then up against a whole pool of buyers, which are going to be first time buyers. They're going to be people moving up and down the ladder and they're going to be investors. They're going to be cash purchases, mortgage purchases. There's going to be a, a, a vast array of people offering on that property, which then creates a bidding war, which then, then means if you do need to secure that property, you're going to be probably paying over the odds for that. So what we're seeing at the moment and the feedback we're getting at the moment is investors uh, and buyers in general at the moment in this current climate to get a property they want or desire in a good area are having to pay over the odds. Now, why is that different when buying off plan or even new build to an extent? It's because you know exactly what you're paying you're not turning up to an open day and having bidding wars and and um, yeah, having to offer over the asking price. It's just you negotiating with the developer um, and, and securing a price based on that. You can see the price per square foot. You can see the comparables. You know what you're paying. So in a market that we find ourselves in today, it is very valuable to have that because you know you're not paying over the odds and you know you're paying the correct value for a property which when you're looking at return on investment that is very key in the current climate we find ourselves would you agree absolutely and i think um as well as the aspect of competition when you go and view a property and you know people uh, bidding and outbidding each other i think what you'll find as well is you'll get a lot of people get emotionally tied or they sell the pro the the idea of owning that property in their head before they've even bought it so they're mm -hmm. maybe making more of an emotional decision rather than a black and white you know going by an email and a due diligence pack they're a bit more tied in a bit more emotionally invested in the property which can cause an impact on on the decisions and the, the final price that's paid so yeah hopefully that gives everyone a good um, overview of the benefits of buying off plan um, and moving on to the next question then We'll try and keep these ones a, a touch quicker. But with regards to locations, how would you advise an investor to ultimately pick a location to invest in, whether that's within a city or regional level? Do you want to give a bit of a take on that? Yeah, so I'll try and do it sort of as briefly as possible. Now, you probably would do it in a bit more in depth than this. But I think, first of all, if, if you're not familiar with any areas, Google. Just Google is going to be a very good friend of yours. Well, google best areas to invest in the uk you'll have hits you will have to filter through some look on look on sites that are speaking about it what are the familiar names being mentioned you'll probably notice like liverpool manchester again just be careful because sometimes you'll see some floated about where maybe aren't once you then seeing a name mentioned quite a few times maybe then pinpointing that so if you're seeing liverpool or manchester or birmingham floating around a lot then start looking into that a bit more so Google Birmingham, and then maybe start Googling popular areas in Birmingham. You'll probably find that you'll have city centers, you'll have little suburbs that are probably coming out well, and then start looking into those areas. And once you've looked at it, found an area which sounds good, um, maybe it's a city center location, and you can see a lot of good, good um, feedback about it, or you're seeing a lot of businesses in the area then you can start your process of looking at prices to make sure it's in your price range. So you might then go on Rightmove or Zoopla and type in Birmingham City Centre or, or type in a postcode of a city centre location, put a radius around it 
and then start looking at prices. Once you found a price and you can see that it's within your price range and it looks fair, you then want to look at rental prices. Same process again for that area that you did for property prices, you do for rental prices. You can then get an idea on rental yield, obviously, which is going to be important for you as well. Um, if yield is what you're focusing on, um, then you start to look at properties from there. So you're then once you found that aspect, you'll have a location, you'll have prices, rental prices, you'll have a good idea on what you'll be looking at. And then you can go out and start speaking to, to agents or, or getting their point of view, or you might be doing that simultaneously to guide you along that process. Um, but yeah, I would just be information absorbing and, and using the internet as your friend to, to get as many brochures to download, looking at developments, looking at what you can get for your money. Um, and trying to speak if you can and have time speak to local estate agents what's the demand like what's the appetite like um, you can go as, as far as looking at sort of crime stats is there crime in the area um, and if you're looking at a secondary market and maybe freehold houses you then probably have to start narrowing down to streets but that's where it gets very very tricky you want to look at the data so use sites such as home track um where you can find out data about specific cities and locations um, they have rental data and, and property price data as well um yeah that would be my starting point when you're when you're looking at where to invest nick what would you sort of throw in the hat there um firstly yep yeah, i'd i'd largely agree with that i think the fundamental point that came across is research and, and due diligence so when i'm speaking to investors i i always say to them look don't listen to what I'm ultimately saying or what other agents are saying. Don't just take their word for it. Get online and do some digging, do some research. Yes, you want to have an advisor who's trusted and will give you some expert advice, but ultimately it's down to you to make a sound investment decision. And there's so many resources online nowadays. There's just literally no excuse other than just general laziness. Um, so yeah, I always tell people get online. I'll send you the links. I'll point you in the right direction. Um, but yeah, do your research. And for me, it's just about you know going for the 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 right location at the right time to getting that that, that key growth that's out there in these regional cities. And cap capitalizing on that ultimately, um, not just going for what's down the road, not just just going where your friend said. You know, look at the data and make a sound decision on that. And just lastly, a um, bit more of a an, an insider uh, look at things here. Um, especially on the new build and off plan side, as a company, as many of our listeners will be aware, we speak to developers and we, you know, package up developments and ultimately market them and, and introduce investors to the scheme. But alongside that, obviously, we keep an eye on what our competitors are doing, what's in the market, what comparables there are, what investors are also considering. So we know that if you're making an investment decision just based on a on a brochure, it's obviously heavily biased. They're going to put in everything positive, everything you, you want to hear and you, you want to see is going to be in that brochure. So what I'd say is go beyond what the agent gives you, be independent and um, yeah, just, just do it an extra bit of due diligence to make sure you get those best locations. But hopefully that was uh, enough on the location side of things. Yeah. So yeah. Um, is it my go now? Shall I ask you a question? No, I'll ask you a question. I think you asked me the question <laughs> okay. there. So, um, uh, frequently asked question. Uh, let's go with what makes a good mortgage broker, in your opinion, Nick? Okay, cool. Um, so, yeah, again, looking at our, our business model, we work with multiple mortgage brokers um, who have access to um, different products on the market. So, for me, reading off a couple of you know key points to look out for is firstly um your personal situation are they teed up to deal with that so are you an expat are you a non-resident are you buying in a limited company do you have properties under your belt already so i would say a broker that is able to um you know speak to you understand your situation and then offer products based on that would be um you know a, a really good play starting point um it sounds obvious it sounds easy but you know if you go to a high street bank you speak to one mortgage advisor you speak to one poor broker um you're going to get you know they might say to you no it's not possible and you're going to get a negative impression and you might make your investment decision based off that so yeah having a broker that can work um you know with different types of investors um i.e what what your situation is is really important um, touching on that as well, uh, a broker that has access to a wide panel of lenders, again, might seem pretty obvious to a lot of people, but 
for some people it's not. So not all mortgage brokers are created equal. Some will have a significantly larger uh, range of mortgage products that they can access at different rates, different time frames, different loan to value levels, i.e. deposit levels. Um, so yeah, again, speaking to multiple brokers or speaking to one good one is going to open up, you know, ultimately more options for you. So they're the two I probably just just read off quickly. So having a broker who can access a wide range of products and also having a broker who can, um, you know, work to your tailored and, and bespoke uh, situation. Yeah, I think to be fair, I think they're the they're the main points I'd covered. Always try and get a broker that's got the whole market, just because you're going to be able to get a better deal. And yeah, like you said, one that's tailored to yourself. I would always ask the broker, "Look, this is my scenario. Have you dealt with people like this before? And if you did, who did you go to? Who did you approach, and what were the rate? You'll get if they have dealt with you before." they'll be able to give you a good indication of what you'll be looking at. That'll make it very simple to then shop around and speak to other brokers and see what you can have access to and what good rates you can get without fully committing to one straight away. So yeah, like anything, you want to have a shop around. And I think one as well that you actually get on with, it's like a solicitor. It's like um, an investment broker or consultant such as ourselves. You want to have one that you you can get along with, have a good relationship or have a good um, feeling about because it's it's quite an important part and you're going to be having quite a, probably a lengthy relationship um, throughout the process, especially if you're building a portfolio in the long term, want to mm. build a long relationship, try and get someone that you um, sort of have that element of of, of trust as well with uh, that you're comfortable yeah, with. Yeah, and just, think to, that's... just to jump in on that one quickly, um, mm. you literally took the words out of out of my mouth um but you kind of related to that so what what makes a good mortgage broker someone that's good at communicating so how mm. quickly do they respond to you how clear are they explaining things are they doing it over phone email or however method you want whatsapp you know communication is a massive thing and it's sometimes in this industry it's it's, it's below par it's just not acceptable both from agents solicitors mortgage brokers i mean i won't go on an absolute rant here but <laughs> the, the point is if you've got a clear you know professional mortgage broker who's communicating effectively it can make a world of difference i think mm. actually on that point very good um, a good tester is to see how far and how much they'll do before you even commit to them because that will also give you a good indication of how much they're willing to work or graft for you because i think what you can find with some mortgage brokers which i've had experience with in the past is they'll hit one bump in the road with a client and they're like i I really can't be bothered with this. I give up. Really sorry. <laughs> yeah. I give up. I can't help you when it's like, no, you can help them. You just really haven't got the motivation to, to, to actually help them out. Um, so again, that's, that's a real good tester when you're, when you're looking for a mortgage broker, see what info they'll give you beforehand, see how much they'll help you um, just off the bat. And like you said, how responsive they are, because that will give you an indication of how the relationship will go. If they're literally like, pay me and then I'll speak to you. That's definitely a sign where you, do, you don't <laughs> you don't want to be um, dealing with them necessarily. But yeah, I think that's that's definitely um, uh, good good points you had there. So Nick, why don't you why don't you pick the the next one? As that that was mine. Cool. Um, well, then floating back to looking at development specifically, and you know the investment decision process. Ultimately, uh, one that we get asked is advice about picking a specific apartment or speaking picking a unit within the development some people they'll you know they'll be proactive they'll they'll go through they'll look at the the relevant information i won't say too much here because i'm asking the question but they'll look at the relevant information and they'll make yeah. a decision but if you are like advising someone how would you pick out a, a decent unit within a development yeah i think i think the first factor it comes down to is what they're looking to achieve and and their budget because that will have a factor so are they have they got a lower end of the budget? Because again, if they've got a lower end, you're going to be looking at a, a lower level um, apartment and tailoring what you pick based on that. So you'll be trying to get the best in that. But ultimately, I think when you're looking at an apartment, it's got to have a mix of um, sort of a commercial or investment view. So the price matches the floor level and then will effectively get you your returns because what we have sometimes is people say, I want the penthouse, um, which is fine. If you're looking at capital growth and you're thinking future-wise resale, that's absolutely brilliant because penthouse, yes, it's a USP, unique selling point. It's um, it's going to rent out all day long, et cetera, et cetera. 
but the yield isn't going to be as strong as maybe one on the middle floor, which is in the exact same position um, and going to have a better yield. Because if your focus is yield more so than capital growth and I would say you're not as fussed about resale and maybe the short to medium term, then that is something you have to consider. But that's that's one aspect. Mainly, you want to look at the views and the space within the apartment. Obviously, if you've got apartments in a in a block and they have balconies, can you atta- obtain um, an apartment with a balcony in the block? Because that will help it's a bit of outside space. Again, it's good when it comes to renting the property. It's definitely a unique selling point. Can you get a position which is uh, quite limited? So corner unit, for example, facing maybe city centre or waterfront. So getting an aspect which is is going to be desirable because these, these are the things you want to factor in, not only when renting it out and trying to command as high a rent as possible for your apartment, but also in the future when you want to resell the the unit as well. These are factors that are going to come in because you will find in a block there are limited units that have sort of limited uh, attributes which you have to then take into consideration. But going up and down the block, usually you can get one within the floor level that will suit your budget. So yeah, I tend to find the actually outlook and the aspect is good. Um, A unique selling point or unique attribute such as a, a balcony or even maybe I don't know, something silly as not all of them have an ensuite to the master. Um, maybe that's something you'll look for as well. So trying to get something that makes your unit stand out from the rest uh, is definitely something, again, to consider. I mean, you're good at this. I know, Nick, you're very hot on picking out good units. What would you sort of add to that? I think you've largely um, covered off the the bits to look for. I think the only thing I'd add in there is about not making silly mistakes so not getting something that's next to lifts or stairs just because mm. it's cheaper yeah. uh not being um on the ground floor or the first floor not being near a main entrance um you know not being i think i said the lift already but ultimately what you you're looking for is to avoid anything that's going to disturb the potential tenant um or the the owner occupier if they're if they're buying personally so yeah go for those usps get that something that will, will differentiate your, your product ultimately what it is um and then just make sure you're not making any silly mistakes in terms of uh, the the immediate vicinity of the uh, the apartment just just on that actually um i know i know rule of thumb is usually don't look at ground floor or first floor i would say i actually don't mind ground floor and first floor i mean that is just my opinion um But again, feedback I've actually had from letting agents sometimes is you will get people that don't actually want to go up in a lift or stairs potentially. Um, So don't, what I would say is don't necessarily rule it out. And again, this is where it comes to maybe speaking to a local agent or or, or the the sort of, I don't know, the the developer or whoever you're, you're dealing with investment consultant wise, because what you might tend to find is you might have an older demographic in the area, which actually may want a lower floor. Um, or you might have on the ground floor, they might have their own doors. So don't rule it out completely. Um, each, funny enough, I did some research on this, um, quite a few months. And when you actually look into it, each floor, actually, all of them have pluses, and minuses as well. So yeah, what I would say is don't rule out completely, completely the floor level. Um, but of course, there are some attributes which are, are more desirable, sort of the higher you go as well. Hence why the price factor comes into things, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah, definitely. It's case by case, isn't it? So there's a lot of people do the opposite thing. They assume just like the, the high floor is the best. I only want, you know, high floors. But if you're paying an absolute premium for it, it's, you know, it can't be worth worthwhile. And I used to, exactly what you said, actually, I used to look after a um, a student development in, in uh, West London, 418 units. And all the time we had people that want to be on the ground floor because they want to nip in and out to smoke. They want to get to the courtyard quickly. They want to go to their car. There's loads of reasons why people would want to be on the lower floors. Um, but yeah, in, in general, though, it is worth saying, I think medium yeah. to, to upper, it's normally a pretty yeah. safe bet. Yeah, you, you're, you're not wrong there. And uh, the, the, across the board of the industry will tell you that. Um, Next next question then I would say is are rental guarantees, Nick, too good to be true? Is that something I get a lot of? <laughs> yeah. Um Yeah, they are or <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's the that's the response. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no more. Um so with regards to rental assurances, it's um not a straightforward answer as as you would expect. Um that 
some most of the time in the market as it is today, nine times out of 10, they're absolutely fine. They're genuine. They're going to come through. In the past, there has been issues, you know, back when I was uh, working for other other companies, um, you know, the, the developers uh, might not deliver. They might not deliver as much uh, as they promised originally. Um, they might run into to issues. So you have to be aware with regards to rental assurances, you are putting your trust in, a, in another firm, whether that's another individual developer, if it's, you know, a management company, if it's a large developer, it doesn't matter. You're taking the control away from yourself and you're giving it to someone else. So. The, the things that we advise investors to do is when you're making an investment decision, look at the underpinning performance of the asset. Is it generating at or close to what's being promised by the developer? So if the developer, for whatever reason, disappears, do you still have a strong performing property there? If yes, then, you, you know, you're absolutely fine. It's almost, you know, redundant what, what the rental assurance is. It's just a bonus that you'll have it fixed for a period of time. But if it's, you know, the real performance of the property is much or significantly lower, one, the developer is um, over-promising and they're attracting you to, to try and get you through the door. And two, are they really going to deliver on that for the next two, three years? Um, so I would say don't just be put off by a rental assurance, but you know, do your due diligence, make sure the uh, the property itself is is decent anyway, and then it can just be a nice bonus to have the security of a, of a, um, of a rental assurance. But just to finish up, just to reiterate on the first point I said, 90 95% of what you see advertised online these days is genuine and and is true it, it's it's not like it used to be where you know you'd offer 10% for 10 years on a residential property it was unrealistic you know there has been high profile press cases uh, things the fca have got involved it's a lot slowly becoming a lot more um uh, rigorous in term and restricted in terms of what what you can advertise and, and what you can offer so if you see something 6 7 8% for one to three years it's normally going to be absolutely fine yeah i think that's that's spot on my my last sort of two pence to add on to that would be is when you look at standard residential buy to lets i would say anything over a maximum of five years being assured to to you would be a red, red flag for me to do extra due diligence as nick touched on two to three years is usually what we see we do see some at five years um and in all fairness we've got one at the moment which is five years but it's a reputable developer great track record so on that side of things realistic return as well exactly realistic return whereas in anything over the like you said the sort of so yield which is looks astronomical or anything over five years i would definitely be looking into it and doing some due diligence because i know um from investors i've spoken to they've been drawn into looking at schemes with very very unrealistic not only yields but um assurance as well for a very long period of time and yeah i just said to them be very careful um definitely do, do due diligence so yeah that's the one thing i'd add on that we could i mean we could do a, a podcast on, on that alone um yeah but just as a very very final point um remember with rental assurances sometimes it can be reflected in the price you're paying at the outset so make yeah. sure you're actually you know yes the return's got to be realistic but the price you're paying's got to be you know fair as well so um yeah just another another point to consider which there. isn't which isn't an issue just on that point because you'll get some people say well i don't want to don't want to pay more but what you have to remember if you're an investor that's maybe a bit nervous and you want peace of mind it can actually work out okay to pay a bit more um in comparison to what you pay without rental insurance for that peace of mind. So definitely, if you do think that's a negative, just just think about yourself as an investor before completely ruling that out because of it. Uh, because I've had some investors question it before, but when I say that to them, because you're, you're leveraging that against a mortgage as well, you're not paying it cash out of your hand, you're leveraging it against mm. a mortgage in most scenarios as well, if you're buying with a mortgage and you're getting peace of mind for a period of time. So yeah, something to bear in mind yeah. on that side. It's the same principle as if you pay a bit more to get something complete or, or close to completion. Um, so, you know, it's the same, yeah. all to do with your, your risk profile. But um, yeah, just to be clear, it doesn't mean just because it's got a rental assurance that it's more expensive or, or overpriced. It's just on occasions that that can be the case. Just got to make sure you're going for the right one. Cool. Yeah. Um, so yeah, moving on to a bit of uh, about the market, about the current conditions. Uh, would you say prices are, or, or how are prices um, reacting at the moment? Are they going up? Are they going down? What, what are you seeing in the market? Yes. So 
surprisingly, with all the media coverage that the UK property market is getting and has got, well, since coronavirus hit, to be fair, um, I do get this question a lot. Um, and that's not just from overseas investors. It's actually from UK-based investors as well, which is quite surprising. But... Um, yeah, nonetheless, I shouldn't expect people to, to, to know that answer. They're not a, a nerd like myself who just keeps an eye on the <laughs> property, property nerd. market. Yeah, exactly. But no, in general, um, that property prices are going up. The property market is strong. The, the common theme throughout at the moment is supply is very low. Demand is very high. You've got the stimulus such as the stamp duty holiday, which has boosted demand as well. Um, and supply has actually gone backwards so across the board in general prices are going up now you have to look at this city by city region by region but that is the the sort of the general consensus and we are seeing areas such as the northwest performing better we're seeing uh, wales as well i mean it's not an area that we we cover um in in all fairness but wales is up there as well and surprisingly i think i think belfast is another area that's doing very very well in terms of property price growth so yeah you do then need to sort of break them down into location to really sort of pick where is doing well obviously northwest we know your main players there manchester liverpool etc um but yes in general in short without going off too long on this um yes prices are actually going up and a question we usually have follow on from that is are they going to continue and realistically and this isn't just us this is your sort of big players such as Savills, jll etc that are doing their forecast and project predictions even sort of home track which is part of zoopla etc um they are foreseeing that prices are going to continue for the foreseeable future obviously we don't know we haven't got crystal ball but yes the way it is the way the property market is propped up and the fundamentals that keep prices going up that is the will continue the main factor which isn't changing anytime soon is supply and demand um which is one of the main factors we're looking at, at why the property market will carry on in the position it will be and again just i'll finish off on this point what we sometimes find is southern slash london investors have a different mindset they will think that the property market it can't go any further it's reached its peak it's overheated and that's because they're sitting usually if they're in london in a market that is experiencing that they're not looking outside of that area because when you look north or other areas prices aren't as high affordability levels are nowhere near as restricted as they are in the south and and london and that again is one of the reasons why we're going to see growth continue in those areas affordability levels in general are a lot more favorable there and that's not going to reach its peak anytime soon whatsoever yeah some really really great insights there a couple of bits to reiterate um with regards to the when you're doing your research and you're you're looking at your data um the well if we take the average growth at the moment is 4.4 percent in the 12 months to july 21 according to home track so average values across the uk are sitting at just over four four percent at 4.4 at the moment Um, and then what you can do is go down and look at you know the top 20 cities or how they're performing um, but the word of warning I would give, and to reiterate what you said, is yes, we can look at the current market and people want to know what's happening. But really, what I like to do is look at look at the trends and see what cities are consistently performing well. So places like, um, you know, Belfast or Edinburgh, um, Cambridge, places like this, they, they go up and down. They're not that consistent. But I've been monitoring the home track report since about 2014, 15. Um, and I can tell you, you know, Liverpool, Manchester, Nottingham, Leeds, they're consistently the high performers. So that's what I say to people. Look for long-term patterns, not just short-term media headlines, what's happening this month or what's happened in the past year. Uh, look for those consistent performers. Um, and then within you know, you might identify a region such as the Northwest. Another thing I always point out to people is you look at Liverpool, look at the average values for Liverpool. It's 136 grand. And you look at the cities, you know, neighbouring it, Manchester, 193. So, you know, 60 grand more. Nottingham, 175. Leeds, 185. And Liverpool is 136. So 
Liverpool is growing exceptionally fast. It's got a lot of room to go with regards to growth. The, dem- the demand is there from the tenant and the investors. It's, it's probably one of the most popular markets in the country at the minute. So, yeah, look at these um, look at these long term trends and then try and pick out you know the pockets of where we think the growth is going to be. Um, but then also do what you said and look at the expert forecast. Don't listen to you know Mr Smith who's just opened his agency ten minutes ago. Savills, JLL, eighty thousand employees worldwide. These people have these companies have teams of people researching producing extremely detailed reports on on market analytics you know go by what they're saying and they are saying you know average growth values in the UK in the next 5 years are due to be very very strong with the northwest leading the way at 28% according to Savile so yeah there's a lot happening in the UK market um and there's a lot going to happen over the next 5 to 10 years as well Hmm, definitely cool. it's, it's exciting times exciting times yeah so next question is this our last one nick Trying yeah to finish up on this one done. Yeah, yeah let's finish up on this one so kind of kind of tied into what we just spoke about there um but more area location focused is um a question we have a lot is is london still a good area to invest so nick what would you say on that point um well, I think London, firstly, is, is always going to be a good area to invest in. Whether it's the best area to invest in right now is, is a different story. Um, I think it does depend on people's, obviously, personal circumstances. If you've got a million quid to invest, you don't have to be as fussy. You know, you can diversify, you can get multiple properties, you can look at commuter belt locations in London, or you can go up to, you know, to the Northwest, you you can pick whatever you want. But if you're starting out, you want to grow a portfolio, it might be your first one or two, you know, buy to lets, you want to get as much capital growth as you can for as little money in, then it's almost a no brainer to invest in in the Northwest over, over London. Fundamentally, in the long term, is London a safe bet, exceptionally safe? You know, it's a global market. It's, you know, attracts attention from all around the world. It's extremely safe for any risk averse investors. It's absolutely ideal. And um, the demand versus supply is just a, a ridiculous ratio. Uh, in other words, there's so many people there. The, the property supply is very, very short, which ultimately underpins the, the performance of the city. But when you look at investment fundamentals, so investment, you know, regeneration, education institution, employers, transport links, you know, London is very, very hard to beat. Um, but for me, over the next five to ten years, I would still be looking at Liverpool and Manchester, even if I had a you know a good good amount of money on me. I'm not sure if you uh, would uh, agree with that, Toby. Yeah, no, I, I do agree. And again, it is investor dependent. Um, but yeah, no, I don't think there's actually much I would add on that. Um, again, if you're looking long term, you're a savvy investor with a very good budget. London is probably always going to be your go to. You'll tend to find London is more so drawn to by overseas investors that don't know the the country. So they don't know the areas to invest because London is obviously going to be uh, like a moth to a flame. It's where they're going to go to. It's they know the about. brand, they know don't it. They? Familiar they with know it. the brand. Exactly, it's it is it is the capital. Um, so on that side of things, it will always have that demand as well. Um, but don't get me wrong; if I had millions of pounds in the bank, I would definitely not be adverse to looking in London. And in all fairness, if you are looking to buy at London at any point, now is actually not a bad time uh, because you can get some some quite good deals. Um, just because there's a little bit extra supply, um, but you obviously need a lot of money to do so. And if you're looking pure pure return on investment in the short to medium term as it stands at the moment then yes i would be with you nick i'd be looking north northwest and putting my money a little bit sort of more clever uh, to, to to work in better uses that way cool um and yeah the other thing i would mention is it's considering the size of london and the scale of the city it's really important not to just um uh, tarnish it as one investment strategy, if that makes sense. Maybe tarnish is not the right word, but um, you know what I'm trying to say is there's different strategies that you can utilise in London. So buying in, you know, Kensington, Knightsbridge, Mayfair is very different to buying in Staines, Twickenham, um, Bexley Heath, or oh, you know, on the outskirts, the, you know, the commute about locations where you can still get good value. You can get in for you know 300, 350 grand. 
get a four, four and a half percent net return after your costs. Um, and, you know, with the, the rate that London's expanding, that's going to see, you know, exceptional growth in, in the years to come. So, yeah, it's important not to, to paint it all as one sort of uh, picture, so to speak. True, true. Well, I think, I think we've done that all, haven't we, Nick? That's a lot. Cool. Yeah. Well, I think that's... Um... I think we've waffled on enough. We we were going to try and keep that brief, but that clearly wasn't going to happen. <laughs> so um, yeah, we can uh, we can call it a day there. But no, um, hopefully that's helped sort of any listeners, investors that have maybe had that question come across them, or maybe it's a question they haven't considered before. And now we've given some insight into to an answer for that. So yeah, hopefully we've been a bit of some help. Yeah, perfect. Well, yeah, good to be back on the podcast. We'll try and be a bit more consistent moving forward. We've got some exciting topics coming up. So, yeah, look forward to delivering those soon. Perfect. Well, thanks for joining us and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Cheers, everyone. Bye.